Ladies and gentlemen, today it's really a big, big pleasure because one of the greatest friends of the CX goalkeeper is back, Faran Niatz, for the third time. Hi, Faran, how are you? Hi, Greg, I'm very happy. Uh, always a pleasure to see you. I'm very happy to be back. Thank you very much for your time and always taking time for me and for the audience sharing your knowledge, your stories. Uh, I am really thrilled to start a discussion about you because today we are going to, dis to discuss about return on investment or as you are sharing in your presentation uh, around the globe, return on experiences. But as yeah. usual, before we kick off, let's spend two, three uh, seconds on uh, on you, who you are and which are your values. Let's start with Farhan. Could you please introduce yourself? Quick shot, yeah. really quick. Yeah. So I'm very privileged that I've been connected with the customer experience world for almost 25 years. Started my career with uh, Citibank. I was 11 years with Citibank, multi part parts of the world. Uh, and then I got headhunted to the beautiful land of Dubai, the sunshine. And since then, I've been here for almost 20 years, working for two of the largest banks here. I'm also privileged. And, you know, a pinnacle of my, my career is taking one of the banks uh, from 23rd to number one bank here in customer experience. And that has that, that such some amazing stories. I think a lot of people have heard about that. Now, um, I started my own consultancy. I go to organizations, helping them improve their customer experience. It's called CX Future. And I'm very excited because now uh, I, I, I help organizations uh, make happy customers. So that's who I am. And on a personal note, I'm also an award-winning photographer. I won a few awards in photography. My work has been exhibited in Italy, Thailand, Pakistan, Dubai, and Pakistan, that's where I come from. And I can confirm that because you are often sharing great pictures, but uh, now let's let's really uh, focus on, 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 on what you said. Um, you said you brought um, one bank from low levels to number one. That's something that you also share in the book, Customer Experience 4. It's, it's a great story. And I think behind that, one of the key success factors from my point of view are the values, your values that are driving you throughout your life and then help you also in this big project and it is a big achievement. Could you please share them with us? I think it's a very good, uh, good, good question. It's an important one because maybe a lot of people don't put too much emphasis. They have values, but it's good to sometime identify them and put a put a point to them. I would, if I look at it, I would probably divide them into two two pieces. One is my personal life, and then there's a professional one. So I'll start with my personal one. For me, honesty and integrity is very important. That's that's the core of my personality because everything that you do, you need to enter into it with a lot of honesty and integrity. I like to be humble. I like to be down to earth. And that's the kind of people I surround with. No wonder you're my best friend. Uh, I also uh, try not to judge people. And that's also very important because people are very quick judging others these days. And like everybody else, I'm a family mm -hmm. person as well, love giving and sharing. And on the professional side, uh, simple basic traits, uh, people who know me, I'm very passionate. So for me, passion in whatever you do with full 100% heart is very, very important. I love creativity. Probably my photography, you know, rubs into, into this part as well. And also at the same time, I'm very curious to know new things. I like to learn new things. And every time I watch your uh, podcast with somebody else, I always learn something new. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, Farhan. That's uh, that's great. I really think that we share a lot of values and I'm therefore keen to, to kick off this discussion with you. Roy, ROI, return on investment, or you say return on experiences. What, why is return on investment so important in customer experience world? It's such an interesting question. And by the way, ever since I think evolution of customer experience and time, people have been discussing this question. There's no specific or definite answer, but the importance of it is very, very, you know, it's it's quite there. I would, uh, if I if I would like to just define it, I would just say, you know, return on investment, is, it's a very important financial matrix because uh, it helps provide you a measure of profitability, efficiency, give you an effectiveness of an investment. So whenever you invest into something, you want to know the cost relation what you get a return out of it. Let me also, uh, I think I would be wrong, Greg, if I related to personal lives as well. I think whatever we do, we're trying to get some return out of it. If I go to a gym, 
I pay money to the to the gym people. I want what? In the end, I'm looking for health out of it. I think my parents invested money in me in my education. The ultimate return they were looking for was that I get good education, great grades, and ultimately a good tenure. That's how we're investing in our... So why should organizations be any different? They need to have some kind of a you know return that they're they're looking for. It's not easy to to quantify. You know that's a different uh, uh, story. However, a very interesting you know fact. Can I share you a very interesting fact with you? Do you know that sixty percent? Uh, this is a very latest study. Sixty percent of the organizations do not measure our ROI. They don't measure it. Only 14% of the organizations are measuring ROI. This shows that how difficult it is. It's not an easy thing. And how little in importance organizations give, give to it. They like to get into the project. They like to get into the front without thinking what the outcome or the result that they're looking for. However, the importance is there. But at the same time, there are some few important metrics where, where I would look at it, the importance of it, why it's it's more important than just financial as a financial matrix. First of all, the ROI gives you the opportunity to evaluate opportunities for the further investment. So if you want to make new investment, it gives you a very good idea where to allocate your resources and your capital. Also, uh, it helps assess your performance. So whether the investment has been profitable, not profitable, it has met your expectations or not, so ROI gives you an opportunity to assess that. Then uh, organizations want to allocate their resources. So there are multiple places where I have a limited resource at hand, budget, limited resources. Where should I prioritize my money? Where should the money go? And if ROI, return on investment, is used properly as a tool, it helps you, uh, you know, to focus on those areas where the investment needs to go in. And last of all, if I may, one more point, if I may add, the accountability. It holds people, businesses responsible for the decisions that they make. It's a very important point because when you give responsibility to somebody, with every responsibility comes a lot of, you know, and. Uh, Somebody needs to hold you responsible, and ROI is a tool that tells you how responsible you've been in your project. Very, very interesting view on on ROI. I think that's what you are saying. It 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 makes sense. It totally makes sense, and it helps us to to understand how important it is not only in customer experience but in business and also in in private life. Uh, I know. And you presented that already several times. So you started linking ROI with experiences and uh, you created or you shared this uh, um, return on experiences. Uh, could you please uh, define for, for the audience what is the return on experiences? Yes. I think uh, whenever we talk about ROI, people are thinking about hardcore investment, but they don't concentrate on customer experience. So since we are the customer experience people, you need to look at the return in terms of customer experience. That's why it's important to look at, by the way, this is not a replacement of ROI. This is a complementary uh, matrix. It's a, it's another, again, it's, a, it's another financial matrix, but very important that when we talk about return of experience, we're looking at three multiple factors that are connecting with each other. So in this performance matrix, we are connecting customer experience to employee experience. So it's a holistic approach of understanding and increasing the value of investment across customer experience through employee experience and also leadership experience. So for the first time when I started studying about this, I came across this term LX, leadership experience. So it's similar to ROI, but it focuses on experience aspects, uh, organizational activities, rather than purely the financial measures. Um, if the question comes to your mind, what is leadership experience? That's a good question, yes. CX we understand, EX we understand, LX. So there is an experience of a leadership. How effective a leader are you in creating amazing employees? the effectiveness of a leader that influences the employee experience. 
And throughout my career, and I'm sure in your careers, you've come across amazing bosses. I, and I'm sure you're a boss as well. And people how people perceive you as a leader. Do you know when you look back today and you say how important the leadership was in how you achieved your customer experience or any other, other goals? I'm very, uh, you know, authentically, I can say this. Customer experience cannot prevail in an organization if it is not trickled down from the lead to top to bottom. The passion of the bottom trickles to the to the bottom. So leadership experiences is a part of it. Um, this particular measure is helping organizations to understand whether or not the experience they are creating are leading to the results that they're looking for. So whatever results you're looking for, it, it helps you understand that. Uh, how their consumers perceive and interact with their brand. That's what it's it's helping them. And what steps they need to take to build more meaningful relationship with the target audience. So look what we're talking about. We're talking about relationships. And because of this ROX, leaders can very clearly see the connection between customer and the employee experience. Now, you said that I've been talking about it, but I would give the credit where the credit is due. This, I, I started looking at it and this is a study which was done by PwC in a global consumer insight survey that they published way back in 2019, but very few people gave attention to this. But this is a study which was done. And the basic idea is that happy customers and happy employees deliver a very measurable return. That's a very simple formula. We all know, know about it. Uh, how is it different from ROI? It has five basic components, and that's what we need to look at. Uh, I mean, if somebody's interested, how uh, EX is, is defined or how EX is looked at, uh, there are components that we need to talk about. One is the pride. The first one is the pride. The emotional commitment of the employees to the brand. So here, employee, you're not looking at the employee experience only, but you're looking at the employee's connection to the organization. Then, second one, second pillar of uh, ROX is influencers. Now, internally and externally, you need to create ambassadors, people who are emotionally, their energy is connected to the organization. And not only they provide great service, but they become your ambassadors. So look at the level of uh, involvement of the employees that you're looking here, that not only that you want them to serve well, but you want them to become your ambassadors. Another pillar is behaviors. So what you do is you do identify multiple positive behaviors, habits, actions that define the culture within the organization. So as an organization, you need to define those behaviors. You need to identify what makes my, my organization click, what makes my employees excited about delivering an excellence experience. So those behaviors I identified and those are highlighted and organizations you know, use that. Then the fourth pillar is the value drivers. There are habits, there are behaviors, and there are values. So you need to identify key values that in the eyes of the customer, now that's from the eyes of the customer, the, the values that the customers are, are expecting out of the organization. And the last one is obviously the financial return and outcome of, of this. Now, uh, let me let me try to give a little bit more sense to this with a very simple example to understand. Many organizations today, you know, when they go to the customer, the customers know them for the value that they're bringing to on the table as their product, not as a... So every organization, good organization around the world has a tagline. Like, for example... Let's, let's pick up Volvo. So Volvo is not selling cars. We all know Volvo sells safety. So whenever you talk about this, this is a value. And what is the return customer is expecting out of this brand? Safety. Not financial, not anything. And that's what the organization is boosting, boosting as well. I can take multiple multiple other examples. For example, let's say IKEA. IKEA is not selling a portable furniture, but a better everyday life for many people. That's their tagline. That's what they what they do. Uh, so 
good organizations have started coming up with those values, with those uh, drivers, where the customer starts getting connected to the to the product uh, uh, and the service. Um, I I don't know if we have the time or maybe it's it's another debate, but there is a formula for ROX which is still being explored. But a simple formula for return of experience is the net value of the benefits a percentage of the cost of investment. So whatever benefit you get out of different activities that you do through employee experience to CX and leadership experience, those benefit and the investment that goes into, you take the percentage of that. And interestingly, they've created some benchmarks as well. Like, you know, NPS has a benchmark and good organizations, uh, different level of CSAT. Similarly, uh, ROX has a benchmark as well. Like for example, if your NPS is less, uh, ROX is less than 100%, you're considered that your experience isn't generating the value. So we are relating the result to the value. If you're less than 100%, you're not generating the value. If your ROX is between 100 to let's say 250, you're starting to see returns but your experience is still underperforming. Your experience is still underperforming. 250 to 500%, your experience is generating average value and contributing to company revenue. Now, look how this, this thing is going. So 250 to 500% when the, when the result comes in, now it has started adding to the revenue. And anything above 500%, the formula, by the way, goes this way. I did a small calculation. And I was surprised that I got a percentage of 450%. I can take you to this, this formula uh, later on. And so anything about 500%, your experience exemplifies best practice for generating returns. So that's the way it is. It's it works. A bit complicated. A lot of organizations are now thinking about it. There's more detailed work is being done on it. But um, I feel when I talk to different organizations, they're a little reluctant because they still need to sell it to the stakeholders. Uh, customer experience people are on board, for sure. Uh, I think it's about leadership experience, so leaders are a little reluctant <laughs> about their value to the experience. I think what you're saying is extremely interesting because you shared what the return on experiences is, uh, how is creator, how is created with these five pillars, how it can be measured, and also how you can check, compare with other companies uh, what you're doing at, at which level you are. And I think this, this really helps. It's a, a, a measurement that really is focused on on experiences and help also comparing with others. And therefore, I think it's it can it can have a really an interesting future because then you can you can see and you can prove the value of experiences and not always only of small pieces out of it. I think the bottom line is that without looking at return only in terms of financials, start looking financials plus experience returns. As well. I, I think that's that's totally makes sense. You, you mentioned something that it's interesting and perhaps also to make it a bit more tangible. Uh, cu customer experience professionals like we are are trying to uh, improve things, are implementing new new things. And perhaps do you have an idea or how do you calculate the, or do you quantify the, the the improvement in customer experience itself? Yeah, I think it's a it's a very good question. And I think it's a million dollar question because a lot of people are trying to. First of all, it's not very easy. Quantifying customer experience improvements, results, outcomes, it's quite a challenging, challenging task. And that's why when I shared the number that only 16% of the organizations are doing it, there's the reason. However, if you look closely into it, it's not very difficult. Let me also say that customer experience success, what is customer experience success? The customer experience success to me is what customers feel about your experience, and in return, what they do to your business because of that experience. Isn't it like, you know, what I feel as a customer and what I feel resonates into what I give back as my return. If I have a good experience, I will give you good return. If my bad experience is, I'll probably leave you, you lose my business, and it, in the end, it impacts you financially. Now, to make it more simpler, I would say that there is a core relation between customer experience, there are some measures, customer experience measures and the business measures. Now, in order to know the 
success, obviously we have the customer experience measures. You know, we know the NPS, we calculate customer satisfaction scores, overall high satisfaction, comfort customer effort score. So that's where your satisfaction and the and what customer is feeling is coming from. So that feeling is then related into the business measures. And how is that happening? So let's look at some of the key business measures, which in terms of ROI organizations should be looking at. So first of all, you're looking at the lifetime value. So how long is the customer staying with you? How that the value that the customer is giving from the day they're coming to you till the time this, that they stay with you? Isn't this the return, the, the business, business that they do with you? Similarly, very important to know your ROI, you must know your retention rate. Are the customers staying with you or not? If the retention or attrition rate is too high, you have a serious problem with your, with your ROI because that has a direct impact on your revenue. Then the churn rate. A lot of customers still stay with you, but they stop. They don't renew. I mean, I, uh, I've been to some uh, social networks where they keep sending me renewal and I decided, no, nah, I don't get enough benefit out of it. And I don't renew it, but I'm still on their books. So you need to know what kind of retention or uh, churn rate you have. Then you need to look at the repeat purchase rate. It's not just the customer. You, it, the customer needs to repeatedly purchase from you. That's where the business is generated. That's where the revenue is coming from. Order frequency, how frequently do you order? The cross-sell rate, how many times, how many other products that I'm buying from you? So these are the elements when you look at these measures to realize that you are your where your revenue is going. It quantifies number of customers upgrading. You know, you need to know how many customers upgrade. If I'm very happy with you today, if I'm a if I'm a prime customer, tomorrow I, I can become become a VIP VIP customer, which means that I'm bringing more value into your organization. Uh, you also need to uh, probably calculate uh, how many of your customers are willing to refer your, your products to, to others because that's where the revenue is generated as well. Uh, Craig, also, I, if I look at the NPS, because NPS is one aspect that we're looking at, and there is a formula which is probably all people who are related to customer experience, they already know that one point increase in NPS is resulting into around two, two almost two million uh, dollars of revenue increase per year. Because how is NPS increasing? If you look at your detractors, and if you just improve, let's say three, three point five, three point seven five percent of your detractors and convert them into promoters, you you're increasing your NPS by one percent, one scale, and then your your revenue dramatically increases. So those are calculation. I'll give you my personal example, just quote. I know we should, might be short of time, but I picked up some very simple things. For example, I was running a call center. So I would go to the finance department and I would say, if I reduce a certain percentage of calls, it will result into cost save. And it's very simple because I know how much each of my call per minute or per second costs. Every organization knows. So you, and how do you reduce call? It's not like you stop picking up calls. You reduce call by improving processes. And that's customer experience. So you invest and say, give me money. I will improve the processes. In return, I will reduce the calls. So customer either I will move them to, to digital. I'll give them an alternative. Or maybe they're calling me for something that I can, you know, uh, handle it some other way. So I did that. You know, you increased Proof five or ten percent of your calls reduce humongous amount of money that you are saving. Similarly, mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I went there, I was looking at SMSs that were going to customers, and I realized I don't know if in your part of the world or not that if the SMS text is too long, it goes as two SMSs, not as one. So customer receives as one mm -hmm. SMS, but the organization is charged by the company as two SMSs. So I reviewed all the scripts. And I converted them into the specific number of characters. And organization for shocked that how much money we we saved. And this is what customer experience does. You look at the process and then you so small saves that you can prove it adds to your uh, return. Right. 
I think these are great example, and in particular the last one with the SMS, because it's not something that it was so expensive to do, but yes. somebody looked at the details. And I think if you want to improve customer experience, then you need to so look at ways. the details. I mean, look at reduce the number of complaints. Yes. It has such a resonance because your people are working on it. You save paper, you save time, you save customer repeat. I used to look at the repeat complaints and say, why, if you have a certain customer who's calling for the same thing more than three times, you have a serious problem with the process. You release that and you reduce. Uh, I think it, it totally makes sense. You are a great storyteller and you have always uh, great stories. And therefore, I think one question is, is still important to, to ask. How do you communicate all this improvement, all these changes, for example, to the finance team or to other teams within the company? Because at the end, at the end it's about to sell the story. <laughs> On a lighter note, you cannot tell a story to finance people. It's <laughs> <laughs> very focused. Oh, they're money driven and story is not going to work with them, but, but that's on a lighter side. But obviously, when you present to them in a manner that they make sense, it now a first question before even I ask this, uh, answer this to you, the question that comes to my mind, like, why is this? There is a it's trust on the finance side with the, with the with the people and why this whole debate? And I always use one very important uh, statement, I say, Customer experience produces blue dollars and finance people love green dollars. Sales is giving you green dollars because you go, you get a customer, it gives you the money and, and you can count, somebody can sit down and count the dollars. Marketing, you know the number of referrals, referrals kind of converting to, into sales, you have the money. But customer experience is not like that. I'm going to the finance people and say, oh, give me the money. I will improve your NPS. After three months, there will be an improvement. It's a gradual process. It's an ongoing process. But they don't want to see something which is after six months. They want to see something which is... So that's a debate where this whole thing starts. Also, another very strange question that comes to my mind is, why do I have to prove? Does every organ, every unit proves it? Do you think that organizations go to HR, finance department, and say, please prove your return or investment on HR, otherwise I will not invest in HR? That doesn't happen. So we're always the targeted uh, target. That's why job of a, of a leader of a customer experience is far more difficult than the others because they have to go and every time prove, prove it. Now, the trick is how to do it, very important. I think, first of all, most importantly, as I understand finance people, and I've had a share of my finance people, lovely people, but they're very focused. You need to speak their language. If they like numbers, you speak numbers. If they like, you know, additional information, you provide additional information. And you can only speak their language, Gregorio, if you understand the person. So if I don't understand Craig as who CFO is, I would not be able to communicate because he will be on a different pitch and I will be on a... So wherever I worked, I created a relationship with them. It doesn't mean that I'm playing golf with them, but it means that I am always in connection with them. Whatever I do, I make sure that they're part of, uh, part of everything. Similarly, you need to lead your conversation with the financial benefits to the company. So overall, so yes, Give me this, but overall, the benefit that it'll give to the company, to all the stakeholders, and which every part of the organization. So if the finance people understand that it's not a benefit that I'm going to give to a certain group of people, they understand and they value it more because you say, hey, the overall, the company is going to benefit out of this. So that's very important. It needs to be. For me, a very important one is to show the benefit over a time period. That's what I was talking about, about the green and the blue dollar, is that if you show them today, invest, after three months, this is going to be the impact. After six months, this is what's going to happen. So give them the full, and this is where the story comes in, give them the full picture and don't say, oh, invest today, after six months, I'll do this. No, take them through day by day that gradually this is the value that I will. So that's their language. They understand it very well because you explain it very well. You need to clearly define your metrics and goals. So say, give me the money, here I need to invest, and here are the indicators. 
I will improve this by this percentage. So you are making actually a commitment, a commitment of the results. They need to see the commitment beforehand so that they want to hold, they can hold you responsible. Similarly, you need to provide the uh, evidence of the impact. For example, whenever I used to do something, I've, I've invested in something, and let's say a customer comes back and writes you a very good testimonial and says, oh, I really like this initiative. Yeah, I, you know, I suddenly I'm surprised. Something amazing has happened. Your service has improved. This mail needs to go to the CFO. We don't do this. We publish it in turn, but we don't give it to the people who want to see the, the impact. So make sure that all your achievements, all the good stories, all the testimonials, they reach back to the people who are who, who are investing uh, into. Other things I can, I can talk about as well, you can address their potential concerns. Once again, before you go to them, be very open-minded. And this is what we don't do. It needs to be a two-way communication. Here is what I want. Here is what I can do. Is there any concern? Please tell me what you want. Come back. I'm sure you're not going to have all the answers on the spot. Take all the concerns, prepare well, go back, answer all their questions. So once all the questions have been answered, I don't think so there's going to be a conflict uh, uh, again. And uh, last of all, I mean, I can talk about a lot of other things, but last of all, you need to collaborate at every step. I used to run a service quality council. I used to chair, uh, and it used to be, have all the group heads, country heads, department heads, CEO, and the financial head. So make sure that every, and my first thing, first 10 minutes is to brief them what has happened in the last last month. So they knew exactly what was going on. And every time I would maybe run a, let's say I'm running a, a journey map exercise. I'll invite a member of the financial team to sit in the in the exercise as well. So they felt part of the whole, whole thing. These are small steps that you can do. It has worked. So hopefully it should, it should work for others too. These are great suggestions. Thank you very much, Farhan. I think everybody can take notes and really learn a lot of what you said. We are coming at the end of this game, but I still have some questions for you. Um, very briefly, it's 10 years time from now. In 10 years time from now, we are back on the CX Goalkeeper podcast. I think it's not the, the, the next time because you will be often here, but in 10 years time, what we are going to discuss about? Oh, <laughs> This is beautiful. Uh, you know, I, as I think about it, I think I can't predict about tomorrow the way things are things are happening. But first, let me let me put my fears fears into it. What I'm fear of, fearful of, not what I'm expecting, but what I'm fearful of. And this is very important because there are some things that I like today that I want to see tomorrow. First of all, I want to. Oh, I hope that the value of the humans in customer experience stays the top priority, even after 10 years. The value of empathy and personal relationships is not going to change. And very important that the smile is not going to be replaced by a bot replacing a human being. I love a human smile when somebody welcomes me, when I go to Starbucks or somewhere and somebody, hey, welcome, sir. You know, what's your name? And those things, those basic things need to stay there. Now, What's going to change? I, I can't predict, but look what has happened in the last just a month or so, chat GPT. It has revolutionized the world. In such a short period of time, the popularity that chat GPT has gained, and there are so many debates that are going on that it's going to impact the CX and people are still debating how it's going to impact uh, customer experience. So also I think metaverse is going to be uh, the world of the metaverse. After 10 years, I think you and I will be hugging each other virtually. Yes. I will stand up and I will hug you because we will have our beautiful avatars. So right now I can't hug you. I can't shake hands with you. I am going to shake hands for you for sure. And I'm going to give you a big hug, which I always wanted. I'm going to meet you for sure one day, inshallah, in person. So that's definitely going to happen. There, there's going to be a virtual world that we are going to be uh, part of. And uh, most importantly, I think organizations must understand that even after 10 years, 
the experience has to be defined by the customer. Not what today, and this is what happened today with many organizations, they got onto the bandwagon of transformation very quickly without really understanding. Customer is not ready for it. Look at the generation then, look at what the customers are desired and what they want, and then provide something according to that. So this, I don't think even after 10 years, organizations like Zappos or Disney or Amazon are gonna change the way that they're doing. The digital is gonna stay. Good digital and a good physical you know, connection. Uh, I, I just hope it's gonna stay. So yeah. Thank you very much, Varun. This is a, we are, we are, so yes, for sure. a great view on, on the future. And now we still have two, three, two minutes, three minutes oh. to conclude. Three questions, three quick questions, please quick answer. Um, is there a book that you would like to suggest to the audience because it helped you during your career or during your life? Uh, not in my career or my life, but it has been a great part of my personal achievement also. And I'm not saying it because I am part of it and you're part of it, but I think CX1 to CX4, everybody should read this because it is a mix of 18 to 20 to 30 different top customer experience professionals globally. Where will you find parts of so many you know, professionals and people who have added value to? Yes, you can pick up a book from one particular person, read it. But to me, when I hear the thoughts and read the thoughts of multiple people for me, that's so CX1 to CX4, customer experience for, our, our, for me. Also, if you want to add one to this, is Fred Reich's new book, because he's talking about NPS3. So winning on purpose is, is the one that probably pick, people should pick up. Thank you very much. And you were also one of these uh, thought leader writing customer experience for, and I think people want to, to connect with you. What's the best way to reach you? I think uh, LinkedIn is for us, all of us. So my uh, handle on LinkedIn is Paran N, F-A-R-A-N-N, Paran N. Uh, on that LinkedIn are all my connects there, like mobile. I love connecting to people through my WhatsApp. So please feel free. My mobile number is there. Just send me a message and I love to connect. Uh, I also have a website for my uh, CX future, so it's cx-future.com. Uh, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram as well. Thank Do the you. Same. And now we are concluding this game uh, with finance golden nugget. It's something that we discussed or something new that you would leave to the audience. Yeah, I remember last time I gave you a nugget. This time I'm going to do a slightly different. In fact, I have created a quote. I always wanted to be on that horizon. And in fact, somebody asked me, Farhan, what's your quote? And it has recently been published by, um, if, I, if I'm not wrong, by Phoenix on the LinkedIn. Uh, these are the people who do the CX transformation uh, summits globally. So I have, this is my, my quote. So I say, customer experience is about promises made and promises delivered. Experiences become exceptional when promises are consistently delivered above expectations. And I can conclude saying thank you very much, Farhan, for your time being a recurring guest. I think the audience understand why you are a recurring guest. Thank you very much. Always love. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And to the audience for today, it's everything. I hope that you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. Feedback is a gift. Please contact Farhan. Please contact me. Let us know what you think. Let's start a discussion. We have a lot to do. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the word of mouth. Subscribe it. Share it. Until the next episode, please don't forget. We are not in a B2B or B2C business. We are in a human-to-human -human environment. Thank you.